Good evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology webinar hosted by Texas Instruments. For tonight, we're going to take a look at using simulations to build understanding. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI technology to make tough to teach, tough to learn concepts accessible to all my students. I'm really excited to introduce our two panelists for tonight, Ray Barton and Mike Kaler. Ray has been a T-Cube national instructor for many years. He teaches calculus and statistics and has helped develop many T-Cube workshops. Ray is a part of a joint effort by Texas Instruments and NASA to develop classroom materials that incorporate actual data and problem simulations from manned space exploration. He enjoys using graphing technology to make mathematics accessible and interesting for students. Ray, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Glad to be here. Thanks, Mike. And Mike has been involved in the T-Cube program and a T-Cube national instructor for over 25 years. He taught high school mathematics in the Kansas City area for 47 years. A consultant for the Midwest region of the College Board, Mike authored the one-day workshop Developing Algebraic Thinking. Mike has instructed numerous workshops on integrating technology in the teaching of mathematics and instructs AP Calculus Summer Institutes. Mike, we're really glad to have you here tonight. Thank you. We're expecting a large crowd, so your audio is automatically muted. Feel free at any time to send any questions you have to Mike or Ray using the Q&A window on the right side of your screen. We'll also be using the chat window to send general messages. As a reminder, this session is being recorded, and we'll provide a link to the event certificate of attendance, as well as the documents that are being used tonight at the conclusion of the webinar. We hope you don't have any audio issues tonight, but in the event that you do, find your name in the participant window. In that same window, you'll be able to find a little icon, it looks like a phone. By clicking that phone icon, you'll automatically receive call-in information, and you'll be able to call in using your phone, which should alleviate any future audio issues. At this point, Ray is going to discuss our agenda. Thank you. So we uh, will finish our welcome and introductions. And then tonight we're going to be looking at several examples. In the first one, we'll determine how likely a particular outcome might be when selecting a sample from a population of cable subscribers. It's related to an old AP test question. And we'll be using both TI-84 and TI-INSPIRE to perform that simulation. In our next example, we're going to simulate a radio station coupon giveaway. There's some money involved. And uh, that's also similar to an old AP test question. We'll just be using the TI-84 to um, simulate that example. Then we're going to investigate the likelihood of gender bias when a sales team was selected uh, to attend the conference. And we'll be using both platforms for that example. And uh, the last thing we'll do is develop a simulation to uh, help understand hypothesis testing. And in particular, we'll be looking at the probability of making type 1 and type 2 errors. And we will uh, look at that numerically and graphically on both platforms. And uh, don't forget that someone tonight will be the lucky winner of two uh, 2018 T-Cube International Conference registrations. Thanks so much, Ray. And Mike is going to discuss our expected outcomes. Tonight we're going to develop simulations that will use the built-in functionality of TI handheld devices. Develop simulation using multiple steps linked in a coherent manner. Uh, use activities to show how simulations related to statistical concepts, including hypothesis tests, as well as type 1 and type 2 errors. And finally, use AP questions to drive the discussion of the simulations. Uh, while most simulations on the AP statistics exam uh, generally presented using table of random numbers. Tonight we want to show how technology can be used. 
And we're going to take some of these old AP questions and show how uh, we can develop the idea of simulation in your classroom to help your students get a deeper understanding so that when presented with questions involving tables of random numbers, they should be able to proceed uh, easily. Mike, thanks so much. You have control. Feel free to share your screen. So the first question that we're going to look at is um, the following from a 2002 multiple choice test uh, question from the AP stat exam. Suppose that 30% of the subscribers to a cable television service watch the shopping channel at least once a week. You are to design a simulation to estimate the probability that none of the five randomly selected subscribers watches the shopping channel at least once a, w once a week. I've got to switch things around here a little bit, so give me, uh, bear with me. So, whenever using simulations, one of the first things that you should do with your students is to make sure, if you want the entire class to be totally random, is make sure you see the random number generators. Uh, to do that, you pick some unique number, student ID, uh, phone number, whatever. Um, I think we'll just use today's date. For me, you guys can use something else. Uh, press the store button, and then in the math menu, whoops, we want to go down and just store that into RAND. And if each student puts in a unique number, then we will um, have uh, different numbers generated by each uh, calculator. Uh, and I do know that today's the 16th, not the 18th. I don't know what I was thinking, but anyway. Uh, once that's been done, uh, so how are we going to uh, simulate this problem? Um, We need to look at uh, nine numbers because we're, if you go back and look at the question, uh, excuse me a second, 30% uh, of the subscribers, so we need one third. So if we generate random numbers from zero to nine and let zero, one, and two indicate that a subscriber watches the shopping channel, that will be the basis of our simulation. And this is true of just about any simulation you're going to do. You have to get a basis of what numbers you're using and what, num uh, what each of those numbers means. So let's generate random integers between 0 and 9. And we'll start very, very simply and build to a conclusion. And if you walk the students through these steps one at a time, it's going to make a lot more sense than trying to overwhelm them with the final result. So again, with the math, probability, random integer, uh, we're going to start with a low number of 1, a upper number of three, uh, 9, excuse me, and we're going to generate three numbers. Uh, low number of 0, Mike? Sorry, low number of 0, my mistake. Thanks, Ray. Save me. So, what do we have here? Well, it looks like uh, one uh, positive uh, number comes up, two, and the others don't. So, in this case, we would have, um, of the nine people, ten people surveyed, we'd have one person that actually was watching the show based on this simulation. In this situation, we have two. And this situation, we have one. And this is a way to start the simulation out. Well, let's see if we can get this to a little bit better situation. Um, let's try random integer again. Oops, sorry. Let's just clear the whole screen and start over.
again, from zero to nine, and we're going to do five. Um, I apologize for that last one. That, I meant to do one at a time, but uh, and just look at each one individually. Now we're going to look at more than one at a time and see what happens. Um, so this would be the same as doing five simulations. And in the five simulations, it would turn out that absolutely none of the times would anybody have watched the shopping network. In this situation, we would have one. So out of 10 simulations, we've ended up now with uh, one time that we've had um, a person watching the, the network. If you took the answer to this last simulation and used the test menu, and ask the question, when is this less than or equal to the number two? Because remember, zero, one, and two was a success. We get zero, one, zero, 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 which means the one success and the four failures. If we went back and generated a new set of numbers, and again, ask the question, in this case, you could see there are two positive uh, results, two true results, and three false. To carry this simulation one step farther, using the math menu of the list menu, we could sum whenever the answer was less than or equal to two. And using the last example, I'm sorry, <laughs> excuse that. So we'll just take the sum of the last result, right? Just take the sum of the answers, all I need to do, yes. Oh boy, this couldn't start off any better, could it? <laughs> let's, Mike, let's just do that random integer command again, random zero nine five, yeah. and then answer less than or equal to two, and then just take the sum of that. That'll be a good review for us. Okay, so we're going to throw out five random integers. We have two of them that are less than two, which would be favorable. And we should be able to check this answer whenever it's less than or equal to two, and that would produce a list of zeros and ones. I'm not going to go through that step right now. and. Uh, so we should have three zeros and two ones resulting with a solution or a total number of two. So out of five simulations, we would get two. So in a class, uh, a small class or a large class, you could have your students doing these kinds of simulations. Again, building to this final step and not just hitting them with this all at once, and then combine that data to get a fairly good probability of what, how many people you would expect to have seen this, uh, to have this result. Now let's do one last thing. And in this case, we're gonna kind of put all of this together into one statement. So we're gonna sum, oops.
the um, random integer Oh, got it. What did I hit? I hit the wrong thing, didn't I? All right, let me get out of here. Yeah, just click that. There we go. There we go. So we want the sum of the random integer. Right. Yeah. So number five, and it's the same zero, one. So you can build this idea up into one um, statement. So by building from the beginning, we looked at random integers zero to nine, what happens? What happens if we take five of them? Uh, what happens if we compare this answer to be less than or equal to two, and what happens when we took the sum of that. So if we put these all together into one statement, this simulation can be done in pretty much one step. We have one. Again, we have one. This time we had two. Again, one. This time, none. So the simulation can be built up from a very, very basic beginning. Again, that first one should have been one, not three. And then go up, and by building and building, we can get to something like this. This is also a uh, binomial distribution. So another way of attacking this problem is to use the random binomial. and. So again, with random binomial, we are going to look at um, five values. Um, the probability is 0.3, and the number of repetitions we'll do will be 10. Let's, let's just start with one, why don't we? You want to start with one? Okay. Yeah, and then just do that um, five times. Okay, so we have one favorable, no favorables, two favorables, three favorables, one favorable. So, so each one is, a, is one binomial experiment with five each trials. One is, each one is one binomial experiment of five trials. And if we so that number in the braces would be the number of successes then? The successful number of successes was, is the number in the braces. That is correct. And if we wanted to do, instead of clicking each one, one at a time, we wanted to see the results of several, then we could do what, uh, we, what we were thinking of doing a few minutes ago, and that is, let's say, putting in 10. And the results would be a list of uh, going from uh, the, the 10 results of three, one, one, two, three favorable outcomes. And as you can so, see through so all Mike, these, each, go ahead. So each one, of, each one of those numbers in the braces would be one, the results of one binomial experiment. One binomial experiment. Binomial. Yeah. If, we, if we looked at five people, we had three people, then one, then one. So this would be the results of 10 experiments. And uh, <clears throat> we very rarely get more than three, it seems like. So. Um, and, and we're looking for an outcome of zero, aren't we? Because we wanted to know the, right. in the original the, problem, the, the, the idea probability was what, of no. The, the question was, what is the probability that no one was watching? And so in this case, uh, somebody was watching all the time, or at least one person was watching out of the five. So uh, the results here are uh, the probability that nobody is watching would be zero. Right. So I think that kind of uh, takes up uh, the first question from the TI-84 part. 
Uh, I'm going to pass it to Ray and let him take a look at it with the um, Inspire. And some, oh, there we go. And Ray, I think you should have it now. All right, so hopefully you can see my TI Inspire screen now. Uh, so we're going to do this, basically the same thing that Mike did on the 84. We'll generate some random integers, um, but we'll do it on the Inspire platform. So first of all, we let's look at how to, <coughs> excuse me, how to seed the random number generator. So if I go to the menu, that's a good place to live to find most of the things I usually need. And then probability, and then random. Here's the random seed. Uh, here I do the random seed, and I don't need a store command like on the 84. I can just type a random number. So I, I'll put in maybe the last, have my students put in the last four digits of their phone number. And then each one would be unique. They'd all get different numbers or different results. Although every once in a while I want them all to use the same random seed on a, on a test if I want them to do a simulation using random numbers on their calculator. I'll have them use the same random seed so that they all get the same results. And it just makes it a lot easier for me to grade um, the, the, all of the tests if they're all getting the same simulation results. But as Mike pointed out, usually we want different results. So uh, in order to generate the random integers, that's also in that math or a menu, then probability back to the random menu. And uh, we use integer here. And the command works the same way as on the 84, so we'll have uh, integers between 0 and 9. And uh, we, so if we just did 1, um, we'd have to do that five times in order to simulate our drawing five uh, table subscribers. And uh, we can see that, that we, I think Mike said we wanted a 0, a 1, or a 2 indicated that a subscriber watches the shopping channel. So it looks like we had one watcher and four um, non-watchers. And then if we want to, instead of issuing that random integer command five times, just do it all together for our five um, people in our survey, then I can just change this one to a five and crank out five random integers in one go. And uh, you can, we can look at these results and see that it uh, looks like, again, there were, in this set of five, there was one person who didn't watch uh, the shopping network at all, and the other four uh, did. And then um, Mike used the 84 uh, comparison. He, on the 84, you could compare this list with less than or equal to two, and it would just count them up. On the, on the Inspire, we need a command called count if to make this happen. Um, if you watch the last statistics webinar back in December, Landy Godbold uh, alluded to a count if command when he was doing one of his simulations. So we'll take a look at that one uh, tonight. So if I want, if I hit the, uh, you can see here I hit the key with the big book on it. That's the catalog of everything. And then all of the commands are in alphabetical order. So I scroll down to count if. And then it shows me what it does. I can put in a list and then a criteria. And the criteria can be a Boolean expression with a dummy variable, uh, the question mark. So let me show you how that will work. I'll paste the count if command back into the screen. Then let me go grab this list and paste it into my count if command. And then uh, comma. And then question mark less than or equal to two. And that will count how many of them are less than or equal to two. So it looks like we had one uh, cable, uh, one shopping channel watcher in our sample of five. Of course, it's easy to just see it here but as we start to ramp this up and have much longer lists then the count command will be useful to see how many successes we had. Uh, and, we, and then last of all, Mike walked us up to putting them all of this into one command so we could combine the count if 
and the random integer command. So I'll say count if, and then get that uh, random integer command and paste it. And uh, we want to generate five random integers between zero and nine. And then I wanted to compare and see how many of those are less than or equal to um, two. So, so this command on the bottom of my screen combines the random integer command that I had before and the COUNTIF command all into one go. And uh, it looks like, again, we generated a sample and there was one um, non-watcher. So this time there weren't any, this time there were two. So we, uh, we can just, every time I press enter, then it, it, it's like drawing another sample and counting how many of them are, um, how many of them are cable, uh, sub, how many of the cable subscribers watch the shopping channel. So now, um, Mike, let me send it back over to you to show that um, that binomial simulation. So I think okay. this back Thanks, to you. Ray. Um, I think we've already done the, the. I think I already did the binomial before we switch it over to you. Uh, oh, that's right. That's right. But one one uh, one comment again. Uh, the um, it says, what's the probability that none of the five randomly selected subscribers watches the shopping channel? So if you were doing this in your class, you would have uh, maybe groups of students or uh, somehow or another combining results. And all they'd really be looking for is uh, how many watched and how many didn't watched, uh, watch. And so they would be looking for uh, how many times they had zero people watching and how many times they had somebody watching. And then the final answer to this question would be um, the number of uh, non-watchers divided by the total number of people in the sample. And that would give you a probability, a randomly simulated probability uh, of how many people were watching the, the uh, the show. Hey, Mike. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Would you mind just sharing your screen? I thought I did. Not yet. You're close. I'm close. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, okay. I've got it. I guess. Okay. I there, guess we I, there we go. There we go. I good. thought I had done that. I apologize. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, I guess, move on to question two. So every Monday, a local radio station gives coupons away to 50 people who correctly answer a question about a news fact from the previous day's newspaper. The coupons given away are numbered 1 to 50, with the first person receiving coupon 1, the second person coupon 2, and so on, until all 50 coupons are given away. On the following Saturday, the radio station randomly draws numbers from 1 to 50 and awards catch prizes to the holders of the coupons with these numbers. Numbers continue to be drawn without replacement until the total amount of the awarded first uh, equals or exceeds $300. If selected, coupons 1 through 5 have a cash value of $200, 6 through 20, $100, and 21 through 50 have a cash value of $50. This is a 2001 free response question. So the questions on the AP exam were explain how you would conduct a simulation to estimate the distribution of number of prize winning uh, winners each week and perform your simulation three times, report the number of winners in each of your three trials. So before we start, uh, Michael's going to run a quick poll, and the question for the poll is, if using a random number generator, what is the maximum number of random numbers that needed to be complete, uh, needed to complete the trial? And Michael, uh, I'll let you, okay, there's the, 
So we're going to give uh, everyone about a minute to answer this. Okay. At which point we'll share the results with everyone. Okay. I will move back to the other screen in case you need to see any of the other information. Uh, I don't know, Mike, can you move that up about uh, an inch or so, the poll, so they can see the bottom three lines of the question? Um, I can still see the bottom three lines of the question without yeah. a problem. Oh, so, okay. Uh, I'm okay. Okay, it looks like the poll's ended, so I'll wait for Ray or Michael to give me the results because I can't see them on my screen. I'll let you know. Okay. Um, oh, now I see it. Okay. Yeah, you got it too, Michael. Mike, good. Okay, so a lot of no answers, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that happens in my class. Yeah. And well, what do we have? Of the, pe of the people that answered, um, we had eight people pick five, eight people pick six, and uh, five people pick seven. So Don't you love that diversity when that happens? It's a good chance yeah. to have everybody. Yeah. I tell them get up and talk to somebody that had a different answer. Yeah. And they get up and talk to somebody, and then I'll send the poll again. There you go. Whoops. That wasn't supposed to happen. Well, the correct answer is six. Now, why? Well, you're going to keep giving out money until you hit three hundred or two hundred or three hundred dollars. Uh, three hundred, three hundred dollars or more. Three hundred, right? Yeah, three hundred. So the minimum amount they're giving away is fifty dollars. So if everybody won $50 after six people won, you would be at $300. So you would never have to have more than six tickets drawn. Now, it could be as few as uh, two. If you had a, a 200 and a 100, then that would be it. So we need to have at least six numbers to look at this. So. Again, we're going to use random integers, and we've decided that we only need six. So let's take a look at what we've got. Um, so math, random integer, um, we're going to generate from one to 50, because they're giving out 50 tickets. And we don't need more than six. And, and so here we go. Um, in this situation, now you have to do a little bit of work. It looks like uh, every one of those, let's see, one to five was $200. Um, And then six through twenty is uh yeah, six through one hundred dollars was one hundred. I just had to refresh my memory. Okay, so six through twenty, so there's a hundred, hundred fifty, uh two hundred, two hundred fifty, three hundred. So five people would win and there would be three hundred dollars. And you would need five tickets. There's one that's lower than 20. So 50, 50, 50, 100, 50, and it'd be the same number of tickets again. And we can look at a few of these. Now something interesting happened in this problem, or this response. In this response, if you'll notice, two people 
two tickets number 39 came up. Now that's impossible because once ticket 39 has been drawn, you can't do it another uh, can't draw another. So we need to somehow or another modify our uh, simulation. And I think it's good to have this kind of a uh, 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 problem come up in the class so you can discuss this. Because if students are using uh, tables of random numbers, once they hit 39 a second time, they need to eliminate it, skip it, not use it. With the calculator, we can um, use another command, and that's number eight, which is random integer no repetition. And this one will, again, be a lower of zero, uh, excuse me, a lower of one, an upper of 50. Again, we don't have to do any more than six, and if we paste that in, now we're guaranteed that none of these numbers will repeat themselves. So here we have $100, $150, $200, $300, $400, $500, $600, $700, $800, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1
And again, no answer wins the contest. Uh, we have. I, I actually, I actually look forward to these now in my class. I, I prefer to get a nice diversity so I can get them up and talking to each other. Right. Well, we have 73 people that need to go talking. Um, <laughs> So uh, the most popular answer here was uh, no, no, which was good. Um, and the response is no. And uh, this is the reason that was stated in the AP um, scoring um, guidelines. Uh, the scoring guidelines stated that the DICE outcome is uh, are independent and the genders of the selected convention attendees are dependent. So that's why the DICE would not be a good simulation. But what would a good simulation look like on a um, uh, TI handheld of some sort? Um, well, we've already discussed the idea of random integers, no repetition, so we really don't need to go through that. And in the interest of time, I may kind of skip ahead a little bit, um, because what we would want to do here is uh, do some random integers. Hang on a second. Um, I'm having maybe my. Maybe in the interest of time, since we've, we've already showed how to use the randint, no rep, if you want to move the ball over to me, I'll show okay. them how to generate a sample well, and draw a random trouble, sample. I'm having trouble system. with my computer anyway. I can't get to my calculator right now, so this is a very good time for you to go. Um, but the problem is I can't get to any, I can't transfer the screen over to you. There we go. Oh, my, I got what I'm looking for. Oh, okay. somebody Looks already like did I've got it. it. Okay, yep, I'm going to see if I can get my computer working because right now I've got a problem. Okay, so I'm going to um, show how to create. I'm going to first of all insert a new problem so that we've got a fresh screen to work on. And I'm going to make a sample of those sales reps. So there were three women and um, six men. And the women I'll just designate with zeros, and the men with ones. So if I counted right, I should have three zeros, and one, two, three, four, five, yeah, six ones. And I'm going to store that list uh, in a variable called sales reps. And now I can use the random sample command to draw a sample from that population. So that's back in my uh, probability random menu. Actually, let me show you another way to, to do that. If I, um, people were commenting, I noticed in the comments about the catalog and how it gives you a uh, little more information on how to use the command. So if I pull this up from the catalog instead, uh, there it is, the random sample command. It shows me that I need a list and then how many elements I'm going to draw from the, uh, from the list. So that's the number of trials. That would be my sample size. And then there's an optional third parameter so that I can either sample with replacement or without replacement. And of course, in this case, I think I would want to sample without replacement. So that last parameter needs to be a one. So I'll say random sample. And then I need to tell it the uh, name of the list that I'm drawing the sample from, which is sales reps. And we were sending three people to the convention, and I want to draw without replacement. So it looks like here's a case where we had two men and one woman. And um, I, I could just keep re um, repeating this over and over to see how often uh, it would, the case would occur where all three are women. And so far, it looks like it's not coming up very often. Um, I could use the count if command and uh, see how many of them are equal to zero, but it's a, about just about as quick to just look at it each time. But that random sample is a great feature uh, to, to very closely simulate what's going on uh, with these a lot of these probability problems that are given on the AP test. So, Mike, should we jump back to the um, the um, smoke detector problem? Are you yeah, ready to move back? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. I'll stop sharing then and give the ball back to you.
And we've, we've got about 15 minutes max on this one, Mike. Okay, I'll try and go through this one relatively fast and then turn it over to you to wrap it all up. Okay. So uh, here's the problem situation. Now this is not an uh, AP question. This is just one that um, I've used before in my classes, a fire chief of a suburban fire department reported that 70% of the homes in the community have working smoke detectors. A reporter for a local newspaper thinking the number's a little high decides to validate the chief's report. A random survey of 240 homes in the city shows that 153 have working smoke detectors. Based on the assumption that the fire chief is correct, how many times would a survey return a result as extreme as 153? Um, so the reporter thinks that might be a little high, so he does the survey, we get 153. So what is that telling us? Well, let's clear this off and we'll start over again. Um, so I'm gonna treat this as a binomial situation. And uh, so random binomial. Uh, we have 240 people in the survey. The probability of success based on what the fire chief said is 70%. And um, we're just gonna do one repetition and let's see what that gives us. Well, there's a 160, 179, a 159, 160, 176, 165. So far, I haven't gotten a 153. Now, in my class, I usually would do something like um, 100, but that takes a little time. So in the interest of time, we're gonna cut it down to like 10. Um, so I'll just, uh, well, So again, 240.7. Um, if you have a really large class, you could give each of your students 10 or 15 or 20 to do and uh, combine results. If you have a small class, you could give 50 or 100 to have them do it. Takes a, it takes a couple minutes, but uh, it's, it's worth it. Um, but for the, in the interest of time here, I'll do 10. Now, what are we interested in? Well, if the fire chief is wrong, we should get some of these things to be less than or equal to 153. So we could check our answer. And is our answer ever less than or equal to 153? And it looks like no. So in this case, we've never uh, gotten any of uh, any value that's less than um, 153. So how does that relate to the idea of a type one, type two error? Um, uh, a type one error is going to occur if the null hypothesis is uh, true and um, we, we reject the null hypothesis. And so in this particular case, um, we haven't done that. Um, so how does this work? Well, if we're doing this with an alpha of 0 0.05, um, a traditional hypothesis test would reject the null hypothesis when we're less than 0 0.05, fail to reject when we're greater than uh, 0 0.05. And the way I present this to the students in class is we talk about a decision value. And a decision value is going to be the value that's going to uh, produce an area to the left of 0 0.05. And I'm trying to keep my eye on the time here. Um, so let's talk about how we could get a decision value. Um, first of all, I'm gonna just real quickly calculate the standard deviation which is going to be um, 0.7. Oh, I'm not in. Um, I'm in classic mode because some of these uh, 
value these uh, lines were so long that you would not see the entire line if they went extended full. So this wraps them around. So I uh, got to think a little bit on this one. So it's going to be 0 0.7 times 0 0.3. And we're going to divide that by 240. And that would be the standard deviation, and I'll store that as an S. Okay. And what we want to do is find out what the uh, value would be. So to do that, under the distribution menu, we'll use inverse normal. And uh, the area would be 0 0.05. Uh, the mean was. Um, well, you got 0.5. You need a 0 0.05. I do have 0 0.5. Thank you. Good to have two pairs of eyes. Uh, uh, the mean is 0.7. The standard deviation would be S, and I do that just so if I need it, I don't have to type all that stuff in a light. Uh, we need the left side. And uh, this is a little bit new for the 84 CE. Uh, the, you can pick left, center, and right. And we'll paste that in. And 0 0.6513 is the decision value. So anything to the left of 0.65, you would reject the null hypothesis. Anything to the right, you would fail to reject. Um, I think I'm going to jump ahead for a second, and I may pass this off to Ray and let him finish because we are running short of time, and I don't want to take the whole time. So the type 2 is failing to reject a false null hypothesis. So let's suppose that the true proportion is 0.65, because if you're going to have a type 2 error, the null hypothesis can't be true. There has to be some other value that is. We're going to assume it's 0.65. And Ray, do you want to take it from here so you have time sure. to do to do your thing? Sure. Did I surprise you? <laughs> nope, I'm fine. Okay. I will stop sharing and push it over to you. All right, um, so last thing we wanted to show you is um, how to calculate probability of type 1, type 2 errors, or the power. And so uh, this graph um, has this decision value. So the x equals d is the decision value that Michael just showed us. And it would be calculated the same way on either the Inspire or the TI-84. And then uh, this graph on the right side is, um, or, or the one on the left side, the red one is, let me show you what I put in there. That's, uh, we're doing a normal approximation to this proportion problem. And so that's a curve that's centered on 0.7 and has the standard deviation of S that Mike showed us. And then the blue curve is, uh, we wanted to look at an alternative hypothesis that the mean is, or the proportion is actually 0.67, then we'd have a different standard deviation. And so the uh, the blue curve is uh, based on a different uh, hypothesis that the mean is, there's actually only 67% of the people have smoke detectors. And um, so this decision value here, anything over here on the left side would be a reason of rejection. So I believe that would be uh, um, type one error if you, if the, if the null hypothesis was true and we actually rejected it, it would be that probability. But the area on the other side here is the power. It's one minus the probability of a type two error. And um, it looks like that's about 0.73. And we can change these, uh, just go back to the Y equals menu and change this to a different proportion and see what the power would be for a different alternative hypothesis. So 
So it's a way to interact um, with different alternative hypotheses and see what the power would be. We've, uh, we ran ourselves out of time a little bit, so this document, uh, I believe Michael Houston is going to post this, and you can download this uh, Inspire document and take a closer look if you want to see how to actually build this um, visualization of power and type 1 and type 2 errors. But uh, now, Michael, I think we better hand the time off back to you. I think uh, Mike and I are about out of time. Sounds good. Yeah. The, you can do a simulation very similar to the type 1 error. You just have to put in the different mean and standard deviation and look for the right side of the decision value. And other than that, the simulation is the same. Thanks, Mike. As we begin wrapping things up tonight, if you have any last minute questions for Mike or Ray, please feel free to get those asked. Uh, I know we're uh, running out of time, but if they have a chance, I know they'll do their best to answer those questions. Ray mentioned earlier in the agenda that the T-Cubed International Conference is coming to San Antonio this year. Uh, it's, it's only just a few weeks away, uh, early March. And we hope to see everyone there so they can explore uh, more technology, more pedagogy. Uh, also, Ray mentioned that tonight we're giving away to one lucky winner uh, a conference registration for that T-Cubed International Conference. And tonight's lucky winner is Tasha Ray. So Tasha, congratulations. We hope to see you as well as everyone else at the T-Cubed International Conference coming up in early March. To receive a certificate of attendance, go ahead and click the link in the chat window. Also, this is a link for the documents that both Ray and Mike used tonight. If these links aren't working for you for any reason, uh, have no fear, you'll automatically get a follow-up email within a couple days. And in that follow-up email will be a link to the recording, so you can follow along at your own pace, a link to the certificate, and a link to the documents. If you're watching this on demand, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're watching this on demand, feel free to copy that link into your favorite browser to receive your certificate. And if you're in the need of any uh, post-webinar follow-up, maybe you have some questions that uh, we didn't have a chance to answer tonight, feel free to give us a call at 1-800-TI-CARES or send us an email at ti-cares at ti.com. Thanks so much, Mike and Ray, for everything you shared tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, just one question I noticed that Mike might know the answer to. Um, West Genesee School asked, is there a way to draw samples with the I-84, a random sample command? I don't think there is that I, I can't recall one right now. Um, I mean, there are some tricks you can play to get a random sample using lists, but right now I can't think of one to take a, an actual rap, uh, random sample like the Inspire does. Okay, thanks, Mike. And again, thanks to both of you. Thanks for sharing everything tonight and answering the questions. Uh, we appreciate it. Thanks again. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Michael. And we hope to see everyone back online next week. Have a great night. Good night.